I believe we are streaming live. Um, this is our first time doing this, so uh, definitely bear with us. We've, uh, I think all of us have been uh, conditioning ourselves to the new normal, which is uh, broadcasting live on various internet sources and uh, social media sources. So I, I'm just gonna do um, a, a quick check-in to make sure that we are indeed streaming this live. So um, Anna, our wonderful marketing director, are we, uh, how does everything look on your side? Uh, great, I see we are, we are live on uh, YouTube and uh, it looks like we are good on uh, Facebook as well. So um, we're here on uh, the dynamic page um, on Facebook. And then we also are live on uh, Cook Optics TV on YouTube and Cook's Facebook page and LinkedIn as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, welcome everybody. And thanks for those who are tuning in uh, live. And thanks to the future audience that will be watching this either on, on our Facebook page or on Cook's Facebook page um, going forward. We're, we're definitely really excited to have this conversation today and, and grateful for the opportunity um, that Eric Johnston from Cook has joined us for, um, which will essentially be um, a, a discussion, a presentation about um, Cook's products, what makes them different, um, you know, and, and the importance to, to staying relevant um, with the newest and latest and greatest technologies. And um, Cook has a, a terrific um, history and, and track record within the cinema uh, community. I'm sure everybody here is, has seen um, uh, different uh, feature films and TV shows that have uh, been used to produce uh, some amazing, amazing content out there. And, and we're very lucky um, to be able to um, to really view Cook as a true partner for Dynamic Rentals. And um, really for those who don't know um, who Dynamic is, you, you probably haven't heard of us before. And that's because, um, you know, we are sort of a, a behind the scenes uh, rental company. And what we really do is we rent equipment to other um, rental companies as a form of, of sub rentals. So um, basically our our equipment is their equipment. We work together to help land um, projects, big and small, um, for rental companies truly across the world. Um, Brandon Zachary is our, our CEO. Uh, Brandon, if you wanna give a, a little wave, um, he's joining us today. Uh, Tom, um, who really is, uh, is in charge of um, leading the, the global sales effort for Dynamic is with us as well. He's live in the UK. Uh, Tom, if you wanna give a little wave. Um, Sean, um, our, our uh, chief technology officer who joined Dynamic um, about a year ago and has, has been a tremendous value for us um, in terms of getting our QC standards uh, to be of the highest quality um, is with us. If Sean, if you wanna give uh, a little raise of the hand. Um, and, uh, and Coda is with us today as well, um, who is um, our senior tech um, out of our Atlanta office, who, who really handles and helps us um, with all facets of the business. You've probably seen him on drives. You've probably seen him fixing things and, and being a backup support. Um, so that's a, a brief overview of who we are and what we do. My name is Austin Rios. Um, I'm, I'm partners uh, with Brandon um, in Dynamic um, and, you know, really, uh, really excited to be here today and to have this conversation um, with Eric. So um, I'll sort of be mon moderating this conversation. There'll be lots of questions, I'm sure, from the Dynamic team, um, as well as lots of questions from the audience that, we'll, that we will take and, and relay in. Um, so we're very, very excited to be having this conversation today. Um, Eric, do you want to give a quick background um, uh, about yourself and, and, and what you do at Cook? Sure. Uh, thank you all for having us here. I know this is our second attempt, and it seems to be working much better than the first. Um, as you said, my name is Eric Johnson, and I work for Cook Optics, specifically Cook America's in sales, and I work with 
um, Christine Brennick, and also Daniel Cabello in um, our office in Brazil. So normally we would be here telling you about all of our great stuff happening at NAB in Las Vegas, but we're going to be doing this live instead. So thank you all for joining us. Appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And I, I know, um, you know, the, the format for today is it's going to be kind of 50 50 a presentation as if we all are in Vegas. So we kind of have to use our imaginations like we're live at NAB today um, and getting to hear a, a really cool um, presentation live from Eric. Uh, but we have to just keep on pretending that for now. And, um, and then it'll be followed by about a 30 minute Q&A session. Um, which will be both local and taken from the live audience. So, um, Eric, do you want to dive into your presentation? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, let's get started. So, hopefully, this is showing up correctly. You're seeing the opening slide. Yes. Yeah? That is correct. All right, so here we go. Um, as Austin said, I'm Eric Johnson with Cook America, and thank you so much for everybody for this opportunity to be here. And this is the first of what I hope is many of the dynamic um, speaker series. And thank you for uh, having me be here first. So the question that we've been asking a lot recently is why are we here? And this is a more existential question, but specifically, why are we here today? And we're here to tell a story. It's how we choose to tell that story that makes us artists. And you guys, all of you, are working together with the finest motion picture optical manufacturers in the world. And together, we're both pushing the possibilities of design and engineering. All so you can tell your very best story. This is just a small part of our story of Cook Optics. For those of you that aren't familiar with us, um, we are one of the oldest continually operating companies in this industry. It's been over 130 years. So when you think of Cook, even though you might not know the brand, although we would hope you do, you certainly know our work. And that work began in the silent movie era and continues in some of the most uh, highly regarded feature films of today and, and everything in between. Just one quick uh, snapshot from that presentation is something that's near and dear to my heart. Here we have George Eastman and Thomas Edison rolling the first film through the first, uh, some of the first motion picture cameras in Rochester, New York. And interestingly enough, the lens in front of that camera was a Cook lens. So you can see that Cook is a company that was there from the beginning, and we will continue to be there uh, today. Just some quick history. This isn't going to be a, a long history lesson about us. But in the 1920s, Cook invented the speed tank roads, which Victoria Storaro once famously called the world's first purpose-built cinematic lens. He is a, a true Cook fan, and these are the ones that started it all. In the 30s, we had something called uh, color enter the motion picture industry. And with the Technicolor three-strip process, Cook was also making lenses for that camera. Uh, just a, a, a brief moment in time of the history, in the 1890s, where we had a, uh, a patent for a, a optical design, which led to a lot of these lenses being produced. The speed pancros, the field pancros, up until the 1930s and the 50s, with what were more modern speed pancros, which many of you are familiar with shooting today, the Series 3. A lot of those have been rehoused by TLS and other companies, and including Cook has re-released those lenses um, as the new speed tank road, which we will, we will get to shortly. So in the 80s, we had some zoom lenses, which I know a lot of you guys would like to see again today, um, which probably not in the near future, because we have too many prime lenses to make. Over nine distinct series, in fact, at this moment in time. Uh, in 1998, we had the S4s, which are really the go-to Cook lens. They are what put Cook on the map in terms of the modern cinematic lens that everybody is used to today. And then we just continue to build upon the success of the S4s. We had the Five Eyes, which are our speed lens. The anamorphics in 
2013 were introduced, which are now, uh, I believe there are more cook anamorphic sets delivered in the world than any, anything else. So we're the premier provider for anamorphic imaging. And then we had the F7 in 2017, which was an interesting thing. If you're familiar with the F4s, the F7s will feel very familiar. It's essentially the same lens that will now cover full frame. So instead of an 18 by 24 image, we're talking about approximately a 24 by 36 size, 24 by 36 millimeter size image, which is what is known as large format or full frame. And then we um, have continued with a number of other innovations, and we will we will get to those momentarily. One of the most important things are the people behind Cook. You know, we're we're not some nameless manufacturer with thousands and thousands of people, you know, cranking these these things out. This is the, the Cook team, and it's about 200 people, give or take. And this is in Leicester, England. This is the same, oh, not the same team. This is these are the same individuals that make all the lenses. So this is a, a company that's all over the world. We are based in, in Leicester, England, and these are the people that put uh, pen to paper and make the magic happen. Without them, we wouldn't have Cook lenses. And the design philosophy of Cook is actually relatively simple. We design lenses for three individuals. We design them for the director of photography, we design them for the assistants, and we design them for the owners, which essentially are the three people that will be using these lenses the most. What are Cook lenses? We talk about all these sort of existential things, but when we really get down to it, a Cook lens has a, a number of things that are being familiar regardless of which series of lenses you choose to shoot. Uh, they were all, for the most part, Super 35, but now we're getting into larger frames, and we're also into anamorphic primes and zooms. All of these can be intercut. Uh, depending on the story that you choose to tell, you can use these different lenses to best tell that story. And because they are all color matched, they can be cut pretty seamlessly without the audience noticing that you've gone between one series to another. Uh, one of the things that, a good example of this recently, is using a non-macro anamorphic in an anamorphic shot. That's being done a lot these days. And it's being done seamlessly without taking the uh, audience out of the story. Uh, we have an award-winning linear focus system, which is a CAN-driven system, very easy to work on in terms of serviceability. The minimum object distance is no more than 10 times the focal length or better. What does that mean? It means our lenses are close focused. And when you really start to use our lenses, we get an appreciation of what that close focus is and, and how that performs. Also, all of the lenses now are incorporated with eye technology. Uh, these are essentially smart lenses. So it's more than just the analog optics of creating an image. Now there's a whole back end side of metadata that all of the lenses from Cook are equipped with. And of course, what is the most important thing about shooting the Cook lens? Well, it's the Cook look. What is the Cook look? And I used to use a whole lot of quotes from very famous cinematographers during these presentations. And then at the end, people would raise their hand and go, I still don't understand what the Cook look is. So here's one from Jan Kressler, ASC. And I think it, it's pretty good. as a contrast without it being harsh. A subtle sharpness, complementary diffusion, all of these wonderful cinematic terms, but you don't really know what they're talking about until you see this. Now, this is a still image um, from Birds of Prey. And this was shot with the Cook Anamorphic two times special flare. And I believe this image does a better job of communicating what the Cook look is than myself or anybody else could, could possibly do. Art is truly in the eyes of the beholder. And when people see images like this, they say, that's what I want my movie to look like. And that's the Cook look. Since we're picking on um, these guys, same cinematographer, uh, this is Matthew Labatique, and this is also the Cook Anamorphic two times FFF anamorphic lenses. And this is a Star is Born. Not a very engaging image of the back of two people's heads, but again, it's a very beautiful image. It's, it's telling a story, and that is why we're here. 
You know, you have the two actors and you have some very interesting things going on that really help to define the Cook look. And same lenses, but a totally different genre. We're going to go into outer space. Wow. Again, I don't know. I, I made all of these images with the anamorphic SF because that seemed to be popping up on the internet when I was putting this presentation together. But I think this is really great because this is um, the Star Trek show that is shooting up in Canada. And there's a lot of talk on the internet about this being one of the best looking television shows on are the best looking shows on television right now. And the DPs that are shooting this are amazingly talented. And I, I was absolutely impressed having met them and, and having visited their set. But here's another way that you achieve the cook look, but this time we're, we're out in outer space. And uh, it's just, it all really works together nicely. And now back to the nuts and bolts of everything. The, the Cook family of lenses, I think I mentioned before, we have nine distinct series of lenses now, although this slide needs updated to reflect that. We have our F4s at the bottom, which were spherical 35 lenses. Then we had the S4Is, uh, the mini S4Is that came after that. We had the 5Is, the Cook regular anamorphics, the anamorphic SF, we added zooms to have a complete anamorphic system. And then three years ago, we introduced the Pancros and the S7s. So you can see that is a lot of lenses. And I'll just quickly touch upon each one of those series individually. The S4s, what um, came about in 1998. So when people ask, you know, what are the most popular Coke lenses? They are the S4s, but that is a function of just how many sets are out there. It's tough to go to a rental house anywhere in the world and not have them have a set of Cook S4s. This is just an absolute standard of the industry. And it's what got everybody all excited again to, to shoot Cook Optics. And with that, another lens set was, was released based on the S4s. It was the S4s Mini. And what was actually done with these, they were a bit slower. They were about a stop slower than the S4s. But with the, making a slower lens, you were able to make a smaller lens. So people that are interested in getting a Cook look that aren't as as hung up on shooting speed, if you will. These are certainly available um, and, are, and are beautiful lenses at a, at a lower entry point, if you will. Going the opposite direction, these are our speed lenses, the five eyes. Um, these are absolutely gorgeous lenses, incredibly difficult to make. And um, they are out there. The anamorphic. This is what you hear a lot about today. There's so much talk about the anamorphic format, and this is because people are trying to get their work to stand out from the crowd. Spherical does a great job of reproducing what is actually in the world. Anamorphic lends a more cinematic look. It doesn't always do a great job of reproducing things exactly the way that they were meant to be seen. But what it does do is a lovely job of making them more artistic, if you will. And we have the Panko Classics. We talked about those 50-year-old lenses that have been rehoused that everybody loves so much. Well, Cook, knowing the secret sauce that made the Pankos do what they do, we introduced a new series of lenses uh, three years ago with the S7s that were designed to mimic that classic Panko And then the S7s, which you hear a lot about these today. People are moving up from the S4s to the S7s to simply cover the larger um, surface areas of the sensors that are being delivered today. And interestingly enough, this is one of the things we would have introduced at NAB. We have three, excuse me, four new lenses in this series. We have three macro lenses. We have a 60, a 90, and a 150. They are all one-to-one -one macros, and it looks like I need to update this because we also have a 300 millimeter F7 that is available now. So we have a, a, the longest lens in this line. And in terms of Cook Anamorphic, uh, we have these are available in two options, regular and SF. SF stands for special flare, or for those who know, super funky. And what that is, is it's a different kind of coating on the front element group and the, and the cylinder. 
And what that does is it creates some interesting special effects, um, specifically a nice blue streak. And this isn't going to work. And that has become one of the most popular lenses to shoot feature films with today. Uh, there are so many lenses out there that are being shot on anamorphic, and specifically anamorphic SF, that most of the lenses we're producing are of the special flare variety. A number of the DTs have told me that you know, if we even had a more overtly special flare option, that would, would be exactly what they would be going for. Um, the Star Trek individuals, they're getting a lot of extra blue, blue streaks because they're actually using some streak filters on their shot to exacerbate that effect. So you see, I mean, there's, there's no right way to do things. There's no wrong way to do things. Of course, there are better ways than others to do them. But it's all about the artist and the cinematographer creating their vision to tell their story. And one of the interesting things about our story, here's the man himself, Les Bellin, the chairman of, of Cook Optics. People often forget the little bits of history, and it was Cook Optics that was the first ever factory tour that John Fowler had given, I believe. And that was a, a long time ago. You know, John Fowler, he is an incredible director of photography. He's been a mentor to me throughout my career, and he is the publisher of Film and Digital Times. And this month is a very special Film and Digital Times because not only has the Cook factory been modernized, and updated, it's just been reopened. And John Fowler just did a whole other factory tour, and that's available online and in print. So if you guys are sick of hearing me talk, which I'm sure you are, please visit Film and Digital Times and, and check out the Cook Factory Tour version two. It's definitely worth it. So that is my short and sweet. I kind of blew through all the lenses. You know, I could sit here and show you guys comparisons of highlights and hair detail all day long, but I don't really think that's, that's what we're here to do today. Uh, I'm going to just open it up for questions. You know, please, let me, let me have it. I, I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking and any questions that you have, I'd love to answer. And if I don't know, I'll either make up the answer or I'll sh uh, shelve it and find the proper answer and get back to you at a later time. Well, well, thanks so much, Eric. Uh, definitely, you know, interesting to to hear all about the different types of lenses and um, the different offering. And I think for the Q&A, it's probably beneficial for the audience if we go back to um, back to gallery view so we can kind of see everybody who's in the conversation. Um, perfect. So uh, there we are. Um, I think that puts us um, back to where we, we should be. Um, so wonderful. I, I think, you know, where, where dynamic is always, um, you know, curious about is what products are coming next, what technology um, is going to push the ball forward, and what are cinematographers ultimately going to demand um, from the rental companies that support them in order uh, for them to achieve their creative look. And, and definitely, um, you know, us, us really having um, a great relationship with Cook has allowed us to acquire many sets of Cook S7s, many sets of, of Cook S4s, um, you know, Pankros, Classics, um, as items that, hey, will be available to every cinematographer, um, no matter where they go around globally. So um, obviously, um, the more products that you guys come out with, the more stuff that we carry, it's our hope that we can get those items into the hands of rental companies so that they can allow the cinematographer to really um, have total creative control um, and not be inhibited by, um, you know, the supply of what's out there. So um, definitely very informative to learn uh, more uh, about your products. And um, I, I also want to, to open it up to, to Q&A on our side. Um, I, I know the group here has thought of a lot of thoughtful questions um, and things. And, and Sean um, Sims, our, our chief technology officer, actually um, went on that uh, Cook Factory tour um, not too long ago here, I believe, in, in uh, at the end of or mid January, um, while we were still able to go outside. So, Sean, maybe do you want to share a little bit about what that experience was like um, going to the Cook Factory and, and, and seeing it for yourself? 
Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Austin. Hello, Eric. Yeah, it was quite an, I mean, it was quite an experience. I was more than fortunate, I'd say, to to pay a visit. I had an, an old engineer that I'd worked alongside for many years. He's a well-known industry specialist in the, in the US and he had just joined your team. So he was over at Cook Training and I drove up to have dinner with him. And uh, the next morning, um, you know, I, I went in to say, you know, farewell. And he said, would I like a, a tour? And what's more, Les Dillon was in the office. So it was an, a fantastic tour. I got the lay of the land. I'd been to Cook many, many years ago, pre the move. And um, yeah, I just saw the entire process, how you upped your QC standard. Um, very much uh, most of your staff look like the nursing staff that, that are now in, in, uh, in our hospitals. We, you know, but um, this is what it took to keep that optical environment clean. And um, yeah, so I do have a question. Um, with your, in your anamorphic arena, when shooting is um, on anamorphics so normal anamorphic and the special flares, do you often see your clients mix it up between the two technologies? You know, Sean, I'm sure they have, but in our market in the US, Canada and South America, they tend to stick with one set. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of examples of people mixing them up. But from my experience, they've tended to stick with one set. And I know that because of a lot of desire to match certain sets, whether it be regular or SS to the B camera. Okay. And then you, you also spoke um, um, about your, the anamorphic uh, aspect ratio. Um, you referred to it being a two times squeeze. It is it not so 1.8 squeeze. Is that not so? Mm -hmm. And um, the new what, full frame anamorphics are 1.8. The traditional anamorphics are 2.0. So when we're talking about the SFs, we're talking about 1.8. We can, the special flare is available in either anamorphic version. So you can oh. get it in the full frame anamorphic or the regular anamorphics. And then uh, just on the, on the 1.8 squeeze, if you know, it's quite an interesting format to have chosen. Um, I know we've engaged on this topic before, but if we could just kind of go back to that topic, um, uh, your experience on the 1.8 uh, squeeze on anamorphic. Sure. When Cook set out to build this lens, there were a number of lenses built. Um, there's a mathematical equation for what the squeeze ends up being, and I think it's a big, long decimal. But long story short, 1.8 was the best looking lens that was built, and that was pretty much a 100% consensus. At 1.6, you have too clean of an, of an anamorphic image. It's almost, it almost looks spherical. And then if you go the other way, 2.0, it's overtly anamorphic. And because the de-squeeze process is somewhat destructive, and Netflix and all these streaming, they're really counting pixels, if you will, these days. And they may have an issue with the destructive nature of the, the de-squeeze process. Um, so 1.8 was what was chosen, and it, it looks absolutely phenomenal. And all of the all of the DPs, whether they're BSC, CSC, ASC, everybody that looks at the lens says absolutely, you know, you guys hit it out of the park. Um, this is this is what it should be. Wow. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thanks, Eric. Um, we do actually have a few questions that are coming in. Um, through the Facebook, um, through um, YouTube. So I just want to let people know that, hey, we are, we are fielding these requests. Um, I see one from Mark Ruiz. I see one from David Ashita, uh, Joshua Osley, and Mo Vega. Um, there's another one from our YouTube um, from uh, Shots the Director. Um, so we'll, we'll be getting to those here um, shortly. Um, I, know, I know some of the, the team that's also here had a few questions. Um, Tom, did you um, did you want to ask anything specifically? Yeah, sure. Eric, uh, great presentation. You know, lovely to see the history. And I can say I've been to many rental houses all over the world, and I can't uh, think of one who didn't have a set of, of S4s. You're, you're spot on uh, with that one. Um, my question was about large format. So obviously, you, you're now uh, producing the S7s, which is your kind of, uh, you know, first large for you know, full frame large format glass now our uh, business obviously by choice we only rent to rental houses so normally when we're deciding to to choose a product 
Uh, it's either something that's uh, generic and mainstream uh, that we know that will rent regularly because people need it, or um, it's kind of uh, niche, uh, high-end items. Now, I wanted to get your opinion on, on, on where the market is going. Do you think we're going to stay Super 35 and um, you know, large frame uh, is, is an option, or do you think that that is going to be the future? You know, I'm going to have to give you my personal feeling on this. And it's certainly a question that I've been asked numerous times. Um, technology is changing on a daily, on a daily basis. When we first started talking about this, it was 2017. And people have often accused the optics manufacturers of being in cahoots with the camera manufacturers. And I can assure you, we basically don't talk at all. We did know that there were these big fat sensors coming out and it would behoove us to come out with the lens that would cover them. So we took the biggest sensor that we could get at the time, which was Jared Land's, I don't even know what it was called, it was his, his white camera that ended up being the Monstro. And when you look at that 46.33 diagonal from the S7, it comes directly off of the diagonal coverage of the Monstro sensor. So that was the biggest sensor out at that portion in time. Now, if other camera manufacturers would have come along with picture heights that were higher or wider, we all, as in optics manufacturers, would have been in trouble. Thankfully, it all fit within that big sensor that RED had come out with, which was roughly based on full frame. So that's where we are today. In the beginning, all of the rental companies were were questioning, is this going to be a thing? Is this something I should be investing in? Then the question very quickly pivoted to, well, if I'm not investing in this, I'm going to miss out on this. And there were a lot of Sony Venices, a lot of Area LS, and these kinds of cameras being purchased. Then people got real excited for this new Airy camera, true 4K Super 35 camera that was coming out for Airy, and they started talking about spherical again. Well, I don't think we're going to be seeing that camera until about 2022. So, you know, there's certainly enough spherical glass and cameras to do all of those projects in the meantime. So we don't have to stop shooting spherical. But I personally feel that the conversation has been dominated by full frame as of late. And specifically, many years ago, it was a conversation about people wanting to shoot 16 millimeter film with their 35 millimeter lenses. Now we're talking about, well, I want to shoot full frame either with my Super 35 lenses or vice versa. So it's a very interesting conversation that's being had. And people are realizing that their regular spherical 35 don't cover full frame, which they don't. However, about maybe 50 millimeters, they are somewhat covering. And how do you accommodate for the wides? And are these really working? And all these sorts of things. And people generally will understand after trying to make all these compromises that they need the correct tool for what they're doing. And people that are familiar with the S4s will gravitate towards the S7s. So that's a long-winded way of answering your question, but I, I believe that's where we are right now. It's, uh, the majority of what I spend my days talking about are either anamorphic or full frame or now full frame anamorphic, you can have your chocolate and peanut butter at the same time. However, I do personally believe that when Aerie introduces the PIA camera in 2022, it's going to uh, swing back to Super 35. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Now we'll still be shooting full frame, but I think it'll be maybe more 50-50 back when, when that camera comes out. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I, I mean, we're definitely seeing um, lots of requests for anamorphic and full frame. Definitely last year was, um, you know, an explosion of full frame um, lenses and cameras um, that we were renting to uh, vast majorities of rental companies who, you know, I, I think saw a major shortage of supply of, of full frame glass as that, uh, you know, initially became uh, more and more popular and as well with the anamorphic as, you know, these tastes change so quickly. And, and like you said, you know, for the DPs that like, you know, Reese's peanut butter cups, um, you're, you're creating options that they can have both of those things, um, the chocolate and their peanut butter 
um, in one. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it, it becomes, I think, difficult for the gear owners and, you know, for us as well, but for rental companies to be able to keep up with the, the broadening tastes um, and demands for, for DPs who ultimately want to create what they want to create, uh, but oftentimes capital limitations um, don't allow, you know, rental companies to be able to go out and buy and have supply for a lot of these tools um, that the creatives are demanding for them. So, um, you know, it's definitely going to be interesting to see, you know, as pull, full frame continues to push forward, um, with a, a looming Super 35 camera coming out from a major manufacturer, where those tastes will go in the future. And, and, and definitely it's something that, you know, I think the whole industry is keeping an eye on. Um, I do want to ask a, a, a question from the audience. Um, this one, um, you know, uh, from, from Joshua Osley, um, who, who's a DP, um, he's asking, uh, I'm uh, looking to DP a feature on Cook Anamorphics, uh, but the schedule may get spread out and I may need to rent sphericals or a different anamorphic for some isolated shoot days for budget reasons. Um, what lenses would you recommend um, that I could use that would work well for this? I'm considering rehoused speed pancros or regular S4s. Um, so maybe that's a question that maybe Sean and Eric could uh, could talk together in terms of staying within the Cook family and, and offering a, a replacement for those items. I the question was he needs a spherical set to match with his anamorphic set. That's that's what yeah, essentially. Yeah, um, I mean, two completely different looks, two completely different lenses, but certainly you can make them match to the best of your ability. Uh, I think I spoke a little bit earlier about some of my customers using inserting macro shots into their predominantly mac um, anamorphic footage. You know, what, what this individual is trying to do is a little bit different. And I mean, if it was that you, off the top of my head, if I was doing this, I would probably match them with the speed pancros because they have a more distinct center to edge fall off than a regular cook lens would do, which I think that would match more closely the field of focus of an anamorphic lens. But you can shoot whatever you want. Exactly. Um, Sean, do you have any any comments on yeah, that? I, mean, I, would, I, would have to, I would have to go to the speed pancros coupled with possibly a little bit of creative filtering. Um, you know, maybe some blue streak filters was to get creative on that end of the, of the lens. Awesome, awesome. Um, I, I, know, I know we also had some more questions from the internal audience. Brandon, um, did you have any, anything you wanted to ask? I do, yeah. Hi, Eric. Um, how, I was kind of curious from the creative standpoint, you know, uh, obviously, you know, with dynamic rentals, we're two steps removed from the client directly um, uh, because we rent to the rental houses. Uh, but it's really good for us and we have to understand that that creative element um, to stay on the forefront of this technology that's coming out. I wanted to ask um, how big of a role does uh, do camera sensors play with the look of Cook lenses? For instance, using say a Cook S4 on a red sensor versus Airy versus Sony. You know, that's a very interesting question. I don't think I've ever gotten that question before. Um, the there's there's a couple of different things going on. Number one, when you're talking about the color science of the camera, there's there's a number of things that are happening. Cook the part of the cook look is it tends to be a warmer lens. Um, however, if you're shooting raw, you're not going to really transfer that warmth because you're going to provide you're going to um, apply a lookup table to the end image, and that's going to what is giving you your color. But what the, what the optics are going to impart is the way that they capture that image. So we just talked about the speed pancros having a subtle, more, not subtle, a more pronounced center to edge fall off. That's something that's going to be hard baked into the image. And I think that's going to be pretty uniform regardless of the, the camera you use and their pixel pitch and their pixel size and all of that. 
I believe it should all be interpreted relatively the same way. What's going to be different is, is, is the color signs and, and how you deal with the, uh, the lookup tables in RAW. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, similar, similarly, as it relates to roadmap and I guess new products and how you, you build your products and, and what, you, what factors go into assessing what that next technology is going to be is one that came in um, from, from David Ishida. Um, he says, on the subject of the mini S4s, is there a plan for something like a mini S7s? Um, that came from your Facebook page. A mini S7? You, we, you think we could make these smaller? I think they're a pretty good size. <laughs> we want everybody to feel like they got their money's worth when you buy a Coke lens. So when you hold it in your hand, you, you know you have something of substance there. Uh, one of the most wonderful things about lens design is the advent of the computer. And with the advent of computer technology, it has allowed us and every other lens manufacturer in the world to create 8,000 different lens sets on paper. And the problem always has been, just as it is with our five eyes, you create these incredible mechanical designs, and then you bring them down to the engineers and they laugh at you and they go, dude, we're not going to be able to make this. <laughs> and so that's where the disconnect has happened recently. It's so easy to design things on the computer, but to actually get them made for manufacture is a, is a totally different process. Um, and you kind of have to find a happy medium between those two. And in terms of building lenses, it's exponentially easier to build a slower, larger lens. And the converse of that is true. So you go the opposite way if you want to build a faster, Bigger lens, or excuse me, a faster, smaller lens, it's just 10 times as hard as it would be to build that same lens a little bit larger and a little bit slower. So you, you have to balance these two things out. We could build very small lenses. There would, there would be a price for that, a price involved. And it's, it's interesting, with all of the pushback we get on our lens size, I know exactly what it comes from. It comes from the desire to want to move the camera in a different way. It's using it on a gimbal or using it on this or using it on that. And a lot of these movies, I mean, you put a cook lens and the first thing it does is go because the movie is not, doesn't have a large enough carrying capacity to do that. So I often recommend the Artemis Trinity from my friend Kurt Schaler for larger cook builds to, to do these types of things. But that being said, if you knew all of the things that had been designed, our biggest problem at Cook is which one we're going to go with next. And we did just introduce four new lenses in the F7 series for NAV, if we were there. The three one-to-one -one macros, which are a 60-90 and a 150, and then also the 300 millimeter macro. So that's, that's four new lenses in the F7 series. Um, will Cook make smaller lenses in the future, well, you see what happens with the S4 Mini. We, those are essentially S4 lenses that are smaller, less expensive, and a smaller housing. So that gives you an idea of where we're at with the technology. Um, there's going to be lots of stuff coming from us in the future. Smaller lenses very well could be, could be one of them. Interesting. I, I know Tom had a question as it related to to kind of roadmap as well, Tom. Yeah, Eric, whilst we're on roadmap as a topic, um, one thing that we've been waiting for for a long time is your your large anamorphic zoom. Um, we have mm -hmm. this one and we have multiple sets of your prime lenses, but one thing we always get asked for um, is that large zoom. But to my knowledge, there's none or, or very few out there. Are we ever going to see that lens released, um, or is it something that everyone should uh, uh, stop asking for? Well, we had two, and I lost one of them. So that brought us back to one. That lens was found, so we're back to two. So that was a 100% increase in the amount of lenses available. I tried to get it on the Jonas Brothers project and was subsequently shot down. It's just not ready for prime time yet. There's a reason why 
No one has created, you're specifically talking about the 45 to 450, 10 times anamorphic zoom. And no one in the history of anamorphic zoom has ever made a 10 times anamorphic zoom. And there's a reason for that. Um, we're, we're getting there. We have released the 35 to 140. We had that in the regular and the SF version. The SF version in zoom lenses is completely different. The RGB curve has to be adjusted because of all the light passing through all of the glass. And it just, it, it reacts in a different way. So I believe that is one of the things that's holding up the 45 to 450. We're now looking at the flare consistencies from these special flare lenses. So that 35 to 140 you, you have, we're looking at, we look at making all of those flares consistent. So when you get a lens from Dynamic in Los Angeles and Dynamic in Atlanta, they, you know, they're two different lenses, they look the same. And so that's what we're striving for, for the 45 to 450. And, you know, I, it was slated to be shown again at NAB this year. So it's, it's going to be finished soon. Um, it's just, it's just a matter of time. Okay. So good to hear. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I'm going to take one more from our, our audience. And then I know Coda has a question um, afterwards. Uh, this one comes from Joe Dollison. Um, he's one of our techs in the UK office. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think it goes in line with uh, what we were talking about in terms of, you know, S7s versus mini S7s and S4s versus mini S4s. But he's curious about, um, you know, what are Cook's main challenges as it relates to actually manufacturing and constructing these lenses? Um, you know, where, where's the, the, you know, the biggest holdup? Where are the biggest concerns? Our biggest constraint is simply output. Every single lens, we didn't touch upon this in the presentation, but every lens that we make is, is hand built. Um, there aren't big um, manufacturing lines churning this stuff out by any means. The cook individuals come in and they might be working on an anamorphic today and they might work on a Pancro Classic tomorrow and an S7 this Friday. They're all pretty much cross-trained to do this. We're just in a very unique situation. Um, I challenge anybody to come up with a product that number one, China hasn't made a copy of, and number two, isn't sold on Amazon. And we have a product that does both of those things. And I'm not gonna get into the reasons for that right now, but it's a very interesting position to be in, if you will. Interesting. So. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Coda, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Hey, Eric. Um, it was a pleasure hearing you talk again and uh, sharing the, the Cook story. It's always a pleasure to hear it. Um, I'm curious as to if there's anything in the pipeline to complement all of these new primes. Um, has, has there already been any talk around the uh, water cooler, so to speak, about a new spherical zoom? It's been a while. You know, as my boss said, everybody that knew how to make those spherical zooms has unfortunately passed away. That seems to be why optical companies tend to specialize. I don't know if you've ever really thought about this. I hadn't until I joined Cook. But optical companies tend to specialize in either, either primes or zooms. So, you know, when you look at our good friend Fujinok, you know, they're in the broadcast industry, but they are predominantly manufacturing zoom lenses, and there's, there's a reason for that. Cook, for the last uh, 30 years, has predominantly been a prime lens manufacturer. I can't tell you how many people, though, have asked for the 18 to 100 to be remade. Mm -hmm. There's just there's a lot of magic to that lens. I mean, they absolutely love that lens. And I can tell you right now, it's not going to be remade in the near future, unfortunately. Part of in the previous question is what we do for manufacturing. We are constrained by our output. So every single thing that we make has a buyer. There is no shelf. In other sales jobs, if you will, that I've been in, you go into the warehouse and you go, okay, guys, we got to sell all of this. All this needs to move. Cook doesn't have a warehouse. And I'm not, I'm not embellishing that. I mean, we don't. A lens is made for a customer. It's put on a table, boxed up, and it's sent out. There's no warehouse storage involved in that. So we're in a very 
interesting point, you know, being constrained by our output, we're essentially at 100% manufacturing. And if that wasn't the case, we certainly would look at new products to build. You know, I, I have a product that I think would, would, would be incredible. You know, I'd like to see Cook move into the still photography world. Again, you know, people often forget one of Ansel Adams' famous uh, favorite lenses was a Cook lens. Um, anyway, as I was told, we can't even think about the still photography world because we're just constrained by output. We are masked with all the cinema lenses that, that we're making, which, which is a good thing. You know, but that, that's part of the magic of Cook. If these weren't all hand built, they they'd just be another commodity. You know, I, I often joke, although some people don't find it as funny as I do, that we have a part number for the dust. You know, that dust only comes from our factory in Leicester. You know, that's very special dust. So <laughs> it's all John, part of the culture. Really it's all part of the dust. Mm-hmm. You need to reorder. Get get in touch. I can sell you some more. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Um, we do have a, a few more questions um, that are coming in from from the audience. Um, Gerard on on our side, Gerard both. Uh, um, he, he's asking about uh, the lens mounts. Um, you know, producing lots of of PL mount only stuff. He's curious um, if if you'll see any EF or, or E mount options. Um, coming down the line in the future. Briefly, we uh, made a foray into the E mount, the micro four third EF mount, and very quickly found out that because of where Cook is positioned in the market, there just wasn't a lot. There might have been interest, okay, but interest doesn't often uh, breed sales success if you will. So we just kind of let that fall by the wayside. Um, There were a couple of technical hurdles that we certainly could have overcome, but at the end of the day, all of this talk about converting our lenses into EF to go on other cameras just isn't what people were doing, to be honest, with, with Cook lenses. So it was more of a distraction than anything else. So when we kind of fast forward, the two lens mounts that we're offering now are, of course, PL, the standard 54 millimeter PL, and then also the new um, Airy LPL mount. So if you want to go the other way, we do have S7 and some of the other lenses available in LPL. So those can be ordered. You can add these mounts later, or we can um, order them to be shipped in that way. Interesting. Interesting. And it's definitely interesting to think about, you know, where, where that LPL fits in, obviously, if, if, you know, with the mini LF becoming more and more popular, we have seen LPL glass, um, you know, uh, the demand for LPL glass has, has risen as units have been available for um, that mini LF. And I think the, the curiosity factor is, again, sort of lies with Aerie in that regard of, What's going to happen with the new Super 35 camera? What is that mount going to look like? Um, and what are going to be the, the tastes going forward um, is definitely something that's all, you know, all on the minds of rental companies um, globally yeah. that we've been talking to. Um, another one from the audience, um, and it's, um, it's coming from Mo Vega. Um, and I think, I think you talked about it a little bit earlier, um, but he's asking how much of the color correction uh, poses changes for the cook look. So I, I guess the way I interpret that question is, is hey, how much of, of what happens in post-production you know, really uh, ha- you know, matters or, or makes a big difference as it relates to what's actually being captured with the lens as far as the cook look is, is concerned? Sure. There's essentially two things going on there. We touched, as you said, we touched upon it before. Um, the what's happening optically, that's not going to be changed by the color. And again, that would be your subtle fall off from, from center to edge. But if you're going for the cook look and you were shooting rack 709, it would come out rather warm. 
That doesn't mean in your luck you can't just absolutely crush it and make it the coldest, bluest image that's ever been. Uh, that that would be taking the color science out of the cookbook, but the optical properties of the cookbook would still be there. So to further explain that question, if you were then to punch in in post production on that, and you're just using the center of the frame, there would be no subtle fall off towards the edge. Everything would be tack sharp. So now you change the sharpness from edge to edge, and you've changed the color temperature, you know, the, the color rendition of the image. So you're really starting to gravitate away from what the cookbook was designed to do. However, it's still being originated with a cook lens. So it's, it's a very hard to grasp concept. And I mean, there's no fine line that says, okay, now you, you've crossed the line of what is the cook look. But the further you deviate away from what is baked into that lens, the less cook-like the look would be, I guess. Makes sense. And I think, you know, as we hear from lots of different lens manufacturers and, and as is the case, um, you know, you can't argue with, with the physics that, it, you know, is involved with that lens. Um, and anytime you try to make a computer correction, you're going to lose some of that um, artistic value that, that the creatives um, so, so much, you know, cherish so much because, you know, it was almost like that when things went from film to digital and you lost that softness, you lost that feel, um, that's sort of what that new age difference is, 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 hey, you're, you're losing some of that drop off and you're losing the value that's really being created in, you know, these, these uh, super expensive and amazing lenses that um, you guys offer. Um, you know, we're, we're running up, it's, it's 1157 now, we, we scheduled an hour for this and, um, you know, we definitely want to make sure our audience is, is entertained by this and, you um, um, ha have been, you know, learning lots about uh, the Cook products, the Cook history, your history, Eric, and, and it's it's all been tremendous. And you know, we could probably go for a couple more questions, and then um, and then we will close it out here. I wanted to see if if uh, Brandon, Tom, or, or Sean had any uh, any additional questions from our internal audience here. Looks like surprisingly, Tom Smith. If you guys haven't met Tom. Um, he never has questions. He's an introvert. He's very quiet. So this is surprising that he's got lots of questions today. Thanks, Austin. Um, Eric, I want to talk about brand. And one thing that Cook has done extremely well is to uh, always be popular. Um, and we've seen like in the past with certain manufacturers and certain products like um, the C300 is a good example. Everyone we're shooting on that for a little while. Everyone was waiting for the, the Mark II, came out a little bit late. And by the time it did, everyone had transitioned across to like uh, FS7. Um, of course, the Alexa Mini is an extremely popular camera. And we're about to see what's going to replace that. But I wondered, what, did, what does Cook do internally to, uh, to maintain that brand? And how do you keep releasing item after item uh, that everyone loves and wants? Well, we make the best lenses in the world. They have the Cook look. Awesome. All we need to do. Now we, we have some incredible people and the, the management at Cook far long, long before me um, did everything right. You know, they have had a vision for the company that has been executed almost flawlessly, And it's truly an honor to work with people like that. Um, who knows what the, what the future is going to bring, but what I am sure of is that Cook will be here and, and be a part of it. So. Agreed. Excellent. Excellent. Any other questions from, from the team here? Well, we're bang on right at 11.59. Um, we, again, we so appreciate your time, Eric. Um, you know, anybody who's who's joined in um, live or is watching this, this video um, after the fact, um, you know, get in touch with your, your rental companies, talk to them, talk to them about the value of, of shooting on super 35 or shooting on full frame, um, you know, make sure that they're working with you on, on exactly what 
um, what look you're trying to achieve. And, um, you know, Eric has been a wealth of knowledge for our team um, in terms of helping us um, assess what we need to buy, what rental companies are going to need, what the DPs really, really want to shoot on. Um, so when you're going out there and, and you're talking to, um, you know, your, your favorite uh, equipment provider, um, if they don't have something, you know, ask them to get in touch with us um, and we'll do our best to, to find, you know, lenses, whether they're ours, whether they're somebody else's, uh, it's, it's our opportunity to really, really get uh, the equipment that you're demanding into their hands so you can shoot um, their project. So um, again, thank you everybody who joined in. Um, thank you, Eric, so much. And, and thanks to everybody at Cook. Uh, Kathy had a, a, a large hand to play um, in this um, and she did a fantastic job helping us uh, get set up and, and uh, Anna as well. Um, our marketing director um, ha has just done a fantastic job. Um, so if there's anything else, any other questions um, that people have, feel free to shoot uh, us an email. You can find all of our contact information um, on our website. And, and I'm sure many of you know who Eric is and, and um, everybody can get in touch with him. He, he's been a tremendous value. So um, really, really appreciate everybody's time and, and definitely looking forward to, to the next uh, series. Thanks, Eric. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Eric. Yes, many thanks, man. Take care.